Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is going to be episode number 169 with Michael Park. Michael Park is a friend of mine who lives in Oregon who has harvested uh, 50 elk with a bow and arrow. And I think this four-part series is going to be something that uh, we can all learn from. And it's going to be great to discuss elk hunting and all the ins and outs uh, of harvesting 50 elk with a bow and arrow with Michael. Before we get to that, I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for all your support. Uh, all of the positive comments that you guys give me on iTunes, the five-star ratings. And I would encourage you that if you're a a constant listener of the podcast uh, to go on there, uh, if you already haven't, and leave me uh, positive ratings. Uh, It helps my placement on iTunes. And it's fun to watch where the J. Scott Outdoors podcast uh, bounces from week to week. I want to thank you guys for all your feedback. If you would like to send me a question, you can do so at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. Also like to encourage you guys to go check out the new website. It's uh, not completed yet, but uh, uh, it's jscottoutdoors.com. And from there, you can link out to my Instagram, at jscottoutdoors, my YouTube channel, uh, my Facebook, uh, we've uh, relaunched the J. Scott business page, uh, and uh, when we relaunched it, I believe I had 3,000 uh, likes or followers, and in about uh, two weeks, uh, I've gotten close to 12,000 uh, new followers. So go check out the J. Scott uh, business, uh, J. Scott Outdoors business page on Facebook. Just type in J. Scott Outdoors. Uh, and uh, follow along there. We've got some great videos that have gone viral. And I just want to thank you guys for all your support. So go check out the J. Scott Outdoors website. I'd also like to thank my sponsors of this podcast. And I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for supporting these sponsors. I get feedback every day uh, from all the listeners who have uh, supported these uh, sponsors. And I want to thank GoHunt.com insider who is my title sponsor of the podcast and they have been since about the fifth episode and i want to announce that gohunt.com insider is doing a 30-day free trial exclusive for the j scott podcast listeners all you have to do is go to gohunt.com forward slash j scott and click on the blue free trial button go through the steps it only takes a couple minutes they will Uh, require you to give a credit card but you will not be charged until after the free 30 days you can cancel at any time within the first 30 days to prevent being charged if you have any questions at all you can email free trial at gohunt.com and someone from the gohunt team will respond promptly guys this is your chance to to go hear what all and see what all the buzz is about uh, with the gohunt insider Uh, The Go Hunt Insider for me is the filtering 2.0 system, uh, which breaks down the western states and uh, all the harvest statistics, all the draw odds. You can look at how many people applied for certain areas, and you can find hidden gems uh, for hunts. You can find uh, they've just uh, released over-the-counter draw odds. Or, or excuse me, uh, harvest statistics uh, and different things where you can find out where you might be able to find that better buck or better bull. Or maybe if you're just looking for areas to hunt that uh, don't get as much pressure but have, uh, you know, uh, very nice trophies. Uh, Go Hunt Insider has been a huge resource for me in researching these states that I apply for. So go check them out. Take advantage of that promo code. I want to thank Go Hunt Insider for their support. Uh, I also want to thank the following sponsors, the Outdoorsmans. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsmans in Phoenix for over 20 years. Uh, They are the authority on optics and hunting tripods and accessories. The Outdoorsmans is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality machined aluminum tripods, mounting accessories, pack systems for all hunters. Uh, Their customer service is the best in the business. 
Uh, we've had Cody Nelson uh, and Floyd Green on this podcast, both owners of the Outdoorsman, several times. Uh, go to outdoorsmans.com or call them at 1 800 291 8065 and use the J Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Also, like to thank Wilderness Athlete. Wilderness Athlete is committing to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order. I also like to thank Utah Hydrographics. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they can dip almost anything into a wide range of camo patterns including the Kuyu Verde pattern. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicle parts, steering wheels, cups, or tripods, Utah Hydrographics can dip just about anything. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that look general and turn them into something that looks fantastic. Give them a call to see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16, that's J. Scott, all one word, 16, promo code. You can visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at utahhydrographics. Guys, I'd also like to thank Western Hunter Magazine. Uh, we just had a big promotion uh, for the $1,500 Swarovski uh, credit through the Outdoorsman's. Uh, Cole Sullivan from Houston, Texas was the winner. Um, and I'd also like to announce a cool promotion that our friends at Western Hunter and Elk Hunter Magazine are doing. If you subscribe today, you can get the newly released fall issue of Elk Hunter Magazine totally free and delivered to your door. This issue has an extensive article from Corey Jacobson on the anatomy of elk. Colton Bagnoli introduces uh, hunters to use suppressors and why we would want to use one. Uh, and want to become an elk guide. Remy Warren breaks down the do's and don'ts of how to get started. And Darren Cooper explains the result of his arrow fletching test with field tips and broadheads. You can go to westernhunter.net and subscribe to Western Hunter or Elk Hunter both uh, for the best value. Uh, when you check out, just plug in the J. Scott, all one word, promo code and you'll receive a free issue that's that's this month's issue that that you would you would miss if you subscribe right now they're going to throw in an extra free issue and it'll be on its way guys let's get right to this episode with michael park and i hope you get as much out of it as i had when i interviewed him welcome to the j scott outdoors podcast today we've got a guy on the other end of the line that's a friend of mine a guy that has shot 50 elk with his bow and arrow, and that is a, a feat that not a lot of people can say they've done. I actually know one other person who's a mutual friend of Michael Parks and I. Uh, that's Casey Brooks, who's maybe killed, oh, a dozen more than you have, Michael, but 50 elk with a bow is an incredible feat. How are you doing? Pretty good, Jay. How are you doing today? You're not rolling down the river trying to catch trout? No, I'm get, I might go out tonight. Um, the green drakes have been hatching at night uh, about the last hour, and I may get a float in tonight. But, uh, yeah, I've been putting a herd on the trout this, uh, this summer. Uh, and, you know, quite honestly, I'm getting ready for my elk hunt in Utah. So my trout fishing has taken a little bit of a backseat. I mean, I'm still pounding them pretty good, but uh, really trying to get prepared physically uh, for this for this Utah elk hunt from from all indication it's a uh, pretty steep and nasty mountain so I'm trying to make sure that I hit their uh, firing on all cylinders um, but uh, yeah I'm looking forward to it how you been buddy good have you know just been working and you know starting to think about elk hunting and you know we're getting close we're getting real close I mean, yeah we're uh, 45 my, days yeah I mean we're 45 days away um, Michael uh, for those people out there that don't know you, uh, they hear 50 elk with a bow, and how old are you, Michael? Uh, 48. I'll be 49 in October. Okay, so, so I mean, multiple bulls, multiple elk uh, killed uh, with a bow, 
and people automatically think, oh, he's just a rich guy. He's just, just yeah, he just buys tags all over, and I wish I had his life. Um, but I know you, and I know you're a blue collar guy. You're 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 the guy next door. Yeah, um, it, it, that's the God's honest truth. I don't think I've ever made more than about fifty five thousand dollars in a year. Um, you know, and I just managed to put together my limited resources and go hunting. I just don't have many other vices, so um, you know, I can hunt elk quite a bit. You, you've you've probably ha- heard it yourself um, from time to time, maybe on public forums or, um, you know, you're such a uh, social media hound. I mean, with all the all the accounts that you have, you know, your Instagram account, your Facebook account. Oh, wait a minute, you don't actually have social media accounts. No, I have. Um, you know, I have an iPhone. That's about it. You know, you can text, you can text me, you can call me. Yeah, you can email me, and I will email you back. But the rest of that stuff, I don't have time for it. Yeah, um, I say that facetiously and laugh because I know you well. Um, you've probably just upgraded from a flip phone, and quite honestly, you could read smoke signals probably than than dealing with any of the social media stuff. And and to that, I I say that with a great ad- admiration because of knowing the type of guy you are and knowing that you're just not into all that other stuff. Um, but you hear 50 elk with a bow for someone that's not even 50 years old. And I mean, I've had people, you know, when you killed your big bull, uh, down in Arizona in 09, uh, four thir- 435 inch elk, you know, I've, I had guys say, Oh, I wish I had his money. And, and I, I think it's a little bit, of of a shame that that automatically comes off of fellow hunter's lips when the reality is you and, and I say this with uh every bit of respect you you're just an everyday joe that loves to hunt elk yeah i mean that that's what it boils down to i mean you know i'm an average you know joe that you know i love to hunt elk and uh you know i kind of make it a priority in my life and uh you know i have a wonderful supporting cast is my better half that allows me to chase them around as much as I do. But I mean, these guys that get all tripped up and, oh, it must be nice and having all that money. It doesn't cost that much. If you really boil it down, you know, license and tag. Yeah, that's a pretty good chunk. But, you know, fuel and stuff like that becomes the next biggest factor, you know, because I think you've been around me a little bit. I mean, I can go eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for two weeks. I mean, it doesn't have to be extravagant on the food so i mean the biggest expenses to me in my mind are you know the license and the tag and the fuel yeah um yeah for sure and i i think i think it's easy and i've heard it before excuses made by some that say oh i can't afford it oh i don't have the money and certainly there are some that can't but i think i I, one question i would have for you is it comes down to priorities and and you've obviously made elk hunting a priority and what would you say to the guys out there that maybe are just getting started and they they don't make tons of money uh how do you prioritize uh your passion in order to to kill 50 elk with a bow by the you know age of 48 um work hard and you know the reward will come to you i mean you've got to put it in gear and, and just say, I'm going to do it, you need to go do it. I mean, you need to um, get a tag, and that isn't that tough. I mean, you can get a tag in Oregon, you can get a tag in Idaho, you can get a tag in Colorado, and basically you can get a tag in Montana. So you've got to take that out of the, you know, that part of it out of the equation. These guys, oh, I can never draw a tag, I can never do this. That's baloney. There's a lot of good elk hunting on public ground where you can just get a tag. So, you know, they need to quit complaining about that and never being able to draw and get a tag and go hunting. Um, yeah, and I mean... That's that's another thing too. You bring up uh, out of the elk you've killed. Uh, I think there's been a couple on private land. How many on public land? Ah, uh, ay ay ay. Um, or a, or a percentage. Eighty five percent of price shot on public ground. Yeah. And what do you say to the guys out there that say I only hunt public ground? And I wouldn't hunt private if I got the opportunity to hunt private. I, I only want to hunt public ground. Uh, 
I can't tell you what I'm really wanting to say, but baloney, <laughs> baloney, baloney, yeah. baloney. I mean, the way I look at it, some of these people are just butt hurt because they don't have anywhere to hunt um, that's private. And, you know, so they're going to knock the guy that has that access or has the money to buy a tag or any of that. I mean, and that's, you know, becoming the norm in this stuff. Knock the next guy down because maybe he's done something better or been at it longer and done it better and you can't get it done. So, oh, let's, you know, no, I only hunt public ground or whatever. I mean, if there's elk on the moon and I can get there, I'm going to get there and figure out how to kill them. That, that's, a, that's a great way to look at it. And that's kind of why I want to talk to you today uh, because you are an incredible resource. Um, and, and, you know, having killed 50 elk with a bow yourself, uh, how many other bulls, or, or how many other elk do you think you've seen killed with a bow? I mean, another 50 on top of that? Yeah, I tried to figure it out here a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's 53 more on top of the 50 that I've killed, that I've, you know, been right there in the pocket when somebody shot them. Yeah, so, I mean, a wealth of knowledge and a lot of experience, and I know the listeners are going to get a, a lot out of, uh, you know, hearing what you have to say about it, and I thought... I might as well go right to the source of someone that's, you know, harvested as many elk because you've literally seen every condition under the sun. You've seen every, you've seen every bad shot, every good shot, everything not to do, everything to do. Um, and so we're going to have, have a lot of fun. I want to talk specifically first and foremost about, uh, bow setup and what you've learned over the years with your bow setup that's led you to, uh, the bow that you're shooting now. And I, I don't, yeah, I, I want to know what kind of bow you're shooting, but I don't really necessarily care about that. I want to talk more about the specifics of your setup and why you are where you're at now and maybe some of the things that you've learned uh, not to do uh, the hard way. And, you know, so now your bow is dialed in and you feel confident going into the woods. So first and foremost, what is your bow setup? Um, right now I'm shooting an Elite Energy 35. Um, and that 34, 35, 36 inch axle to axle is something that, you know, I've always had really good success with in the past. I've shot some shorter bows and they've just been real critical, and I find myself coming back to something in that 34, 35, 36-inch axle-to-axle range. Um, with, you know, I think this bow's got a 7-inch brace height, and for me, that's always worked well. I'm not the world's greatest archer, so I need kind of um, something that's fairly forgiving, um, and that's just worked well, that kind of combination. It doesn't really the manufacturer so much, um, but, you know, those measurements have worked really well for me in the past, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of back to that, and I'm going to stick with that. So the Energy 35, how many pounds are you pulling? Um, I don't have a clue. It's a 55 to 65-pound bow maxed out, so I'm guessing 66, 67 pounds. Gotcha. And, I mean, let's say 10 years ago, were you pulling a 75 or 80-pound bow? Uh, up until last year, you know, I'd always shot 72, 73 pounds. I've shot that for a long time, but um, the old shoulder's just kind of getting a little sore, and, you know, I figured I might as well drop the poundage down a little bit. I mean, if I could kill them with some of the dinosaur bows I'd killed them with 20 years ago, I mean, these these bows nowadays have, are so much more efficient that, um, you know, 65, 66, 67 pounds should be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about uh, arrow weight and why you feel what you're using is is the the right component. Um, I think right now I'm shooting about a 425 grain arrow, um, and I've always been somewhere in that 425 to 450 grains. With um, with the uh, with the feel, with the uh, broadhead or or without? With. That's okay. that's with a hundred grain broadhead. Um, Basically, for years, I've shot some type of Easton AC arrow, be it an ACC or a full metal jacket. I've dabbled with some other things and some, you know, delved off into some other brands, And but I always find myself back at either a full metal jacket or an ACC. I mean, they're just, you know, yeah, a lot of guys say they can bend, but, you know, you don't shoot that many of them up in the woods in a year, so it's not that big a deal. 
Um, they just work well for me. Great. So, what kind of what kind of kinetic energy are you getting with your setup now? I don't have a clue. And why why is that not? You hear so much about it. Why do you think that it's not something that you focus on? Um, like I say, it comes down to these the bows and the equipment we're using nowadays are so much more efficient. I mean. The first elk I shot in, I think, 1981 with a two-wheeled Browning bow with, at 55 pounds and a 2016 aluminum arrow almost went clear through that elk. And, uh, you know, I think that might have shot a whopping 185 or 190 feet a second back then. So, you know, this thing way outperforms it, and, you know, I th- it works well for me. Um, I think a lot of guys get all spun up in this FOC and how much kinetic energy and... Um, Sometimes I think they spend too much time with it. I mean, they overthink it. That's my thoughts. Um, but I mean, it makes perfect sense. So, in other words, you're taking your bow, you're going out to the target, and you're shooting, and you know from the experience that you've killed uh, with these bows that weren't even shooting 200 feet per second to probably, I'm guessing, you're probably in the 200 and... 75 feet a second, you know, 265 to 275 feet a second, so 100 feet a second faster uh, than some of the old technology, you're not really worrying about all that other stuff. Is that what, That's what you're telling me. Exactly. I, You know, you can get into all this stuff and, you know, screw around with different components and arrows and get the weight forward and yada, 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 yada. But, I mean, I figure if Easton sends me an insert that weighs this amount, that should work. I mean, they've been around forever, and you know, I just put together what comes from the factory and shoot it, and it works well. I mean, I wouldn't want to get hit with it. <laughs> I mean, that that's what I boil it down to is, would you want to get hit with it? No, I don't think I'd want to get hit with it. So, um, What draw length are you shooting? 28 and a half. 28 and a half, and has that changed over the years, or has that been pretty much your draw? <laughs> no, it's uh, gotten a lot shorter over the years. <laughs> um, I can remember some of the first bows I ever had, 30-inch 30, 30 draws, thinking that was the norm, pulling it way back past my ears and all that stuff. But, you know, I've found that with it shortened up, and um, it, I can shoot a lot more accurately. Okay. Um, what kind of sight are you using? A multi-pin sight, a single pin? What are you using? Um, I'm shooting, well, it's a single pin with another dot in the pin itself. It's a spot hog what do they call it, a fast Eddy XL or something like that. But basically it's a single pin, and they've put another reference you know, point in, in the pin itself. But basically I work off a single pin um, on a wheel. And um, Last year was the first year I went to a single pin on a dial, and I just absolutely love it. My eyes in the last couple of years have really went downhill. Um, something for all the younger listeners to look forward to, you know, your eyes are going to go bad <laughs> at some point. You you know, you think you're young and invincible and your eyes will never go bad. Wait till you get in your mid forties. Yeah. I mean, I can attest to that. Uh, I've been shooting up here in Colorado, getting ready for, as soon as I found out, I drew the, uh, beaver unit in, in Utah and I'm not kidding you, Michael. I, I went out and I shot and I shot at 40 yards and it was kind of late, kind of late in the evening, my first, you know, just out, very first time out shooting again, and I can't see the fletchings in the target, I can't even see where I'm hitting with my naked eye, and I was thinking, what the heck is going on, and then, you know, um, dang sure you should get out, you know, yesterday I was shooting 70 and 80 yards, I have to actually pull up my binos to look to even see where I'm hitting, and I mean, I've always been one of those guys that kind of prides myself on good eyesight, and it's 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 kind of just happened, and I didn't realize it, but, uh, you know, I used to be able to, uh, I want to say out to, you know, 80 yards, I could see exactly where I was in the target and where, where I had hit, and once it goes, it goes. Yeah, welcome to the club. <laughs> welcome to the club. So are you using a clarifier or anything in the peep side, or are you just um, dealing with it right now? I'm just dealing with it right now. Um, when I back away from shooting at targets and go to 3D 
type of targets. I don't have the problem that, you know, it's not so blurry, but uh, these smaller targets, I've gone to where I paint my targets totally flat black on the face and then put an orange or a white dot on them to shoot at. And that's helped a lot. Um, you know, as far as sighting my bow in and shooting in the backyard, that's, you know, my the way I shoot. I have, luckily, two different directions from my house. I have 3D courses that are up year-round that I can go shoot. And, in fact, when I get off the phone with you, I'm actually going to go walk one this afternoon and shoot it. So when I go into shooting 3D targets and shooting live game, it's not that big a deal. But, boy, shooting at targets, I just, the color combinations throw my eyes bad. What have you found as far as fletching colors? Have you found colors uh, that work better? And then the same question with pins. And since you're shooting a single pin, it's it's probably an easy question. Uh, single pins green, and that was after consulting with a fella I had met at a Pope and Young banquet that was an eye doctor. I went right to him and said, what do I do? And he says, ditch the red. First thing to go has got to be red. And he says, shoot green or yellow, and I'm shooting green. And I shoot chartreuse fletching. Um, I can see that the best, and I, you know, can't see that well. Okay. So moving from the multiple pin to the single pin, being, you know, a bow hunter, you you hunt blacktails, primarily blacktails and elk. Um, but tell me from an elk perspective why you've switched to a single pin and kind of some of the the hurdles that you had to overcome or or what have you with that change last year um you know i was all worried that it was going to cost me shots and things like that opportunities but um i started out with a mindset last year okay i'm going to leave it set at 30 yards um you know if i take a bunch of the elk i've shot and grind the math out on them i believe you know the average shot is 28.3 yards so I left it set at 30 most of the season last year, um, you know, and it, with that, I, you know, practiced with it and it shot about four inches high at 20 yards and about five, six inches low at 40 yards. And I don't really like to shoot past 40 yards anyways, um, just because the unforeseen chance of them taking a step and uh, I've seen more good shots go bad with an elk taking a step than just about anything else combined. For sure. Um, so last year when you shot your elk, uh, it was the first one that you shot with a single pin. And I'm, by the way, I'm shooting a single pin also. And I just feel like I, I haven't determined if I'm going to leave it at 30 or 35 or exactly what I'm going to set it at. But the, the idea for me of most all the elk that I've shot with a bow have been, you know, in that 30 yard or in range is that, you know, I can hold dead on with one pin and as the bull's approaching, uh, coming into the call or if I've snuck up, I basically just need to range, uh, you know, 30 yards, figure out where that point is. Or if, you know, if I set it at 40 yards, range that point and know that any, any time he walks inside of that, I'm just going to, you know, adjust where I hold my pin to me, that sure seems like it simplifies things. Yeah, I, I, I really thought it did. Like I said, I thought it was going to catch me and bite me in the butt at some point last year. But the two bulls I killed last year, um, I snuck up on one of them, and he was raking a tree. And, you know, I had my pin set at 30 yards. And I thought, you know what? Just calm down. He has no clue you're here. The wind's good. Let's range him and, you know, use this sight to its fullest potential. I range him. He's 39 yards. I dial it to 39 yards and shoot him. Um, yeah. You know. And then I think the second one I shot, I had it set at 30 yards, and the bull came into the call, and it was like I'd looked at a couple windows and thought, well, if he comes out here or here, I don't need to move my pin. And, you know, he popped into one of the openings and started raking a tree, and it's like, well, he's like 32 yards. So I just pulled back and shot him. Um, worked really well, just a lot less clutter. Um, where I really thought it would catch me is hunting deer, and it, again there it didn't. Um, it worked really, really well. I mean, I just don't see me ever going back to multiple pins don't you feel like in the heat of the moment uh multiple pins um I, I mean i don't care what anybody says when there's a bull elk screaming his guts out and he's coming in glunking and breaking trees and you know coming and you're sitting there and whether your top pins at 20 or 30 or whatever you're you know you start counting pins 
have you been in situations with multiple pins where you're like, all right, where's my 40? Where's my 50? Where's my 30? Um, have you had direct situations where you've had those thoughts go through your head where you almost panic because you can't remember which pins what? Uh, honestly, not that I can really ever remember because I like to shoot them close. So I'm usually working when I was shooting multi-pin sights, I was usually always working off the top two pins um, because they ended up in my lap. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you hear the horror stories. I've mis- misjudged it on deer a couple times, you know, running a gun and deer on the ground and, um, you know, misjudge it by 10 yards and at 50 yards, I mean, you miss. Plain and simple, you miss. Yeah. H- how big is your site housing as far as um, one thing I've seen with single pin sites, um, I've seen them make the housing actually i've seen some that are pretty small actually on my matthews bow i have a sherlock that's pretty small it's not much bigger than a seems like not much bigger than a quarter and i feel like a bigger housing especially for elk when you're you know hand-to-hand combat type stuff it's one thing if you're shooting way out there long distances but like we've talked most elk are shot you know 30 yards and in I feel like if you've got a little housing, um, that can create a problem when that bull's coming in and you're trying to acquire your target and get on it. Uh, curious about your thoughts on that. Um, absolutely. I mean, you've got, you kind of want to have a big, you know, I say would call it a field of view. And I want to say the housing on the side I'm shooting right now is about two inches. I just walked out in the living room and looked. and um, I shoot, I think it's a 3 sixteenths peep, you know, which... All that could be made smaller for better accuracy, but, I mean, we're, they're where I want to shoot them, which is usually 30 yards and closer. I mean, I've got a pretty big target to shoot at. I can usually, you know, hit a baseball with a broadhead in, you know, 30 and in. So, um, you know, those bigger apertures were really good for picking up the target fast and, you know, getting settled in, getting the pin settled and uh, making them really dead. Making them dead. I love it. Um, what release are you using, and has that changed over the years? Um, right now, I'm shooting a Carter Quickie One, I believe it's called. Um, it's a hook shooting a loop, and that's the first release I went to once I went to a string loop, and I've stayed with it. So I want to say I've been shooting it about close to ten years. Um, before that, I'd always just shot a Scott Caliper, you know, and hooked directly to the string. So. That's one of the things that's changed for the better is a string loop. What kind of, um, what have you seen as far as shooting with the loop, uh, just tighter groups, uh, no impact on the on the knock and, and arrow influence? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the biggest thing I see is, you know, I went from shooting a caliper right off the string and, you know, just the wear and tear. I mean, you set it up and once you get it set up and tuned right, um, you know, there's just it does nothing breaks. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk um broadheads with your um setup and what you're using now. Um using a trophy taker shuttle T broadhead. Have been since I wanna say about two thousand and six. Um and have had really good luck with them. They shoot really well, um they penetrate really well and like I say, they make stuff really dead. <laughs> really dead. Uh, I remember one in particular that was really dead that <laughs> was a giant that scored 435 inches. Yeah, we made elk meat out of him, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm referring to 2009. Michael had drawn a uh, great tag in Arizona and I was able to um, help them out and and run around with them, and we just had a good time chasing bulls, and probably would have killed that bull the first, uh, the you know that first day bull that uh, we kind of got screwed up on, um, and it's probably a good thing we didn't, although he was a big bull. Yeah, he he was a really nice bull, and we'd have been tickled with him, but you know at this point I'm really happy those two you know giant neanderthal mouth breathers came along and threw the deal up <laughs> for us because it turned out a lot better you know and fortunately you know got to hang it in his uncle's cooler so he got to see a picture of it and you know 
Yeah, um, I, I'm curious about. So, when, when you, how long did it take you to start shooting a release uh, from when you started archery? How long did you shoot fingers? Oh wow, I got to think about this one here. I probably shot the first 15 years with fingers before I went to release. And for you, shooting a release, um, other than the consistency, I mean, is it, it's just night and day difference, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, it's just so much more precise that, um, you know, some of the equipment we had back in the old finger days, it was, you know, it was high tech at the time, but it's really crude. I think the stick bows today probably, you know, blow it out of the water. Um, yeah. Is there any part of you, Michael, that, you know, you've already killed 50 elk with a bow. Um, is there any part of you that wants to make the sport harder? Meaning, I mean, do you want to go and say, I'm going to start hunting with the recurve or I'm going to start ha- hunting with the stick bow or, or I'm going to go back to fingers. I mean, um, you hear about it all the time where guys get to a certain point and they feel like, you know, I've, I've got to stop fishing, fly fishing with a graphite rod. I'm going to go back to fiberglass to make it more of a challenge. I'm just curious your thoughts on that mindset. Um, I've thought about it and I will probably eventually get a stick bow and, you know, I'd like to, you know, try and kill one with a stick bow just to say I've done it. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. It'd be a new challenge. Um, <clears throat> there'd be some bulls that get passed up now that would get shot with a stick bow, honestly. Um, yeah. you know, but yeah, I'd like to try it and I will try it at some point, but I'm not quite there yet. 50, maybe at, maybe at a hundred you'll, you'll, uh, no, I, I need to kill, you know, I, I've got other goals. I want to kill one in every Western state and New Mexico is the only state on the list that I haven't killed one yet in yet, but that's all because I've never, I've never drawn a tag there. And once I can draw a tag there, one of these days we'll knock that off the bucket list. And I'd sh- like to shoot a nice Roosevelt. That's one thing I've shot a couple of them, but I'd like to shoot a nice one. Yeah. Um, so New Mexico is the only Western state that you have not killed an elk in. And is that just a function of you haven't drawn a tag? Yeah, I have, I have not drawn a tag there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, um, that's a pretty neat thing to be able to say. I want to ask you what, what you have this year, uh, that you're going to be hunting. What tag do you have? Have you drawn anything? Um, I've got a late archery rut tag from Yule Deer in Nevada, and that's the only thing I've drawn this year. Um, so over-the-counter elk here in Oregon, real possible that I'll end up in Idaho with an over-the-counter tag there too, and then uh, Mule Deer tag in Nevada and a couple deer tags here in Oregon, and that'll be a pretty busy fall. Yeah, and so your elk, uh, right now your elk is over-the-counter in Oregon? Yep. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, talk about finding bulls on public land in multiple states, and we're going to cover that in the next episode. I think one of the things that's pretty cool about having you on is that you have killed an elk in all the states except for New Mexico. So you're the perfect person, uh, to speak about that as well as we're going to talk about uh, three things that, that can, in another episode, we're going to talk about three things that can help you execute a great shot under pressure. And having killed 50 elk with a bow, you have seen a lot of those situations. And the, one of the questions I'm going to ask you on that episode is when it came down to number 50, since that has been your goal to kill 50 by the time you're 50, I, I want to ask you about how number 50 went down and, and did you feel the heat? So that's going to be on another episode. Uh, I want to thank you for spending time telling us about your bow setup. And I look forward to picking your brain on uh, finding bulls on public land because you've obviously been able to do that. Anytime. You know, you know I'm always here. You know the right, telephone buddy. number. <laughs> yep, that's true. I know, I know which direction to send smoke signals. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you on the next episode. Sounds good, buddy.